Let, let me just talk about anxiety for a few minutes. You write whatever down you want. I struggled with this this week. I thought I had an answer to the reasons why, and then I trashed it all Saturday and said, I, that ain't going to work, right? And yet I'm going to still present something to you. Because this is a very deep, strong subject. One of the things that anxiety brings up is a lot of people ask, what is wrong with me? What's, what's wrong with me? And you put yourself in a category that you think no one else understands or feels. What's wrong with me? Some of you would say, I feel so alone in this. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. No one knows. I said this earlier. No one knows what's going on. I present a good front. Everything looks fine, but it's not. Some of you question God because you wonder, does God even care about anxiety and about these things? They seem so petty and small to him. Maybe you think that. That is not true. But you feel that. Does God even care? Some of you might even wonder, is anxiety sin? And I read this week, I was working through it, and I read a big article from a very popular guy that, that I tend to like, and he pretty much said it is. And I felt... To say it nicely, like, like doo-doo. And I was filled with anxiety. What did I get wrong? What am I doing wrong? And then I rethought about it. I looked at the scriptures that I'm reading. And I said, anxiety is not sin. Now, it can lead to sin. For it drives me to bad choices and decisions often. Just keep that in mind. But if you're dealing with anxiety today, it is not sin. But it could cause you to sin. It might drive you that way. It has done it in me. And then one of the biggest things that goes along with all of that is on the outside, you look like you have it all together. Like I look at you right now and, and, and I'm like, man, I must be the only one that deals with anxiety. Everybody out there, a lot of you today, man, you've got it all together. But some of you inside, because you hide it well, you suppress it. But underneath, it is paralyzing you. You are exhausted. You are frozen in a place and can't seem to move. And I'll say it in just a moment. It's like it's choking you. I have anxiety in various forms. And uh, I'll tell you two. I don't know if they're real super huge to you. You might look at it like, well, that's nothing compared to mine, and you're probably right. It's not that, and this is not all of them. I'm not telling you the deepest, darkest. I'm just going a little level up in the, you know, the, the kiddie pool style, okay? But one is the long term that I dealt with is my wife and I do not have children. We have dogs, and one of our first rescue dogs that we got when I first started walking the dog in my neighborhood, I was very comfortable on the leash, and I would just enjoy the beauty of, I live in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, I was, I was pastoring at the time in Jacksonville, and I'm just loving life, and, you know, it's a new adventure for us, and all this stuff, and don't know where life is going, but I'm walking the dog, and I'm relaxed, and I'm enjoying it. One day, on my street, just houses down from the street, a big dog runs out, does not give us any space, does not do the butt sniff and greeting that dogs do. Is that all right to say in here? Just making sure you're still awake there, all right? Pastor just said but in church, okay. Uh, they don't do that. He just bites my dog. In the melee, bites my leg. My dog grabs its neck and I think it's going to kill it. So now I'm worried about my dog. I'm worried about that dog. And I call for this dude to help me. And I am panicky. Choke the dog. Get it to let my dog. Let, get it to let go. The dog runs back. I go home, my wife's like, what happened? She, if you know my wife, man, she went down to the neighbors. <laughs> you do not mess with Heidi, man. She is my protector, and I love it. <laughs> my biggest fan, she's a rock star, man. And it just proceeded from there. It, it just got, it, it was just embarrassing, the whole thing. Not her, but just the situation. That didn't create the anxiety, but what, what created the anxiety was that event. You know what happened for the coming years, and I will tell you, it spilled into my life over and over again, is I never walked my dog for years again feeling comfortable in my own neighborhood. Here's what's worse. Though I would not admit it, it, it fleshed out, it spilled out into my wife's life, into others' lives, into my dogs, because they feel that anxiety 
It caused me to want to stay home, hole up. You have things much deeper than that that does, it, it does the same thing. I wonder what that is for you. I needed to go, and, and we'll talk about this for a moment, to a therapist just to get help with that. And then when I went to the therapist, that dude uncovered all sorts of junk. <laughs> and this Christian guy poked and prodded for my benefit. Tomorrow, like I have anxiety right now in what I'm going to tell you. It's consumed me for a while. Tomorrow I go to the dentist. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Clean my teeth. I got good teeth, man. I keep them clean. I go every six months. No problem. They're nice. I love my dentist. Great folks. But tomorrow, I have to go replace uh, an old, 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 old crown. No, my teeth's pretty good. My teeth, <laughs> my tooth's pretty good. <laughs> And uh, they got to replace it. High anxiety because they're going to stick this giant wedge in my mouth. They're going to put a tube of water and a tube of sucking whatever they need to do in there. They're going to put a thing on my nose. And I swear they're going to try to kill me within that hour and a half. I have high anxiety. Every time I've had to have that done, which is not very often, they're, they're like, hey, Ron, just relax. And you're like, just shut. You know, and you want to like. Relax. And it just it just does that. I'm thinking about it right now. I gotta go at 8 a.m. in the morning. I don't want to hear your techniques. I don't want you, I don't you could pray for me, but uh, you know, I know you got all these answers, man. Just give me some drugs, knock me out, and wake me up. Is my answer. <laughs> all right. It's anxiety that I got right now as I'm speaking. Thank you. That hurt. That was a kid, wasn't it? <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Thus I say the struggle is real. All right, I don't need to hear it over there. Come on, man. <laughs> that was fantastic. You and I were not created to exist in a constant state of anxiety. It's not how God created us. Drains your joy, leaves you stressed, burned out, exhausted, feeling alone, paralyzed, your purpose is not living in fear, but in freedom. What does that look like concerning anxiety? Just real quick, a definition of some of these things. You may feel anxious. Some anxiety can be healthy. It drives us in the right direction. But when it causes us to focus thoughts so much that we give unhealthy attention to it, I can experience worry, tension, nervousness, or unease. I can at times... I know some of you do this too. Maybe you can think it through. I can almost get worked up that I anticipate something that isn't even probably ever going to happen. It's going to happen. It's unclear. I get wrapped up in my own narrative that leads to over-concern for something that may or may not happen in my life. And that can, if let go, turn into paralyzing fear. Which means then I feel, this is where it builds in the bad, where it can turn into sin. I feel like I need to control something. So control becomes one of those issues. But I can't. Now these issues, let's just remember we're whole people, are spiritual, emotional, and physical. Because you have physical symptoms. I mean, there is a list. If I read them all, you're like, we all got anxiety right now. My stomach hurts. Oh, no. And now you tell a narrative that, you know, no, it wasn't the big old giant burrito you ate last night. It's, you're filled with anxiety, right? It flipped the switch and the narrative would be different. But symptoms can be an elevated, elevated blood pressure, heart rate, heavy breathing, trembling, trouble sleeping, stomach issues, fatigue, exhausted. I'll probably feel some of those as I walk into the dentist office tomorrow. I'm here, you know, and I'll feel that. Roots of that. We can't not talk all about this, nor am I a psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor, or therapist, but there are roots that can be just a lot of pressures of our past, problems and phobias that lead to panic. If let go, it can lead to a deep sense of despondency, discouragement, and depression. 
Some of you are battling that right now. There may be other reasons as well. It's not all this, but these are some of them. And here's what really is, is, a, is a big deal too. It's often linked with a sense of personal powerlessness and a loss of meaning and enthusiasm for life, which then causes me and leads me into unhealthy decisions. Again, control, I avoid, I hide so that I can feel better. When reality is I'm not doing myself a favor at all. And you feel alone. Many biblical characters dealt with this. Didn't just start in our lifetime. Here's where I want to take you in the beginning, and I'll wrap up with the story of Jesus and some practical stuff in between. I believe, this is what I was working through and wasn't fully ready to commit to all the reasons, but I'm going to present some to you today. I believe that this really started in the garden in the very beginning. God would come, he created this giant earth, and I'll talk about this in a minute. He gave margins so they could be free and live in harmony with him through the Sabbath and rest. And he gave some boundaries. Hey, you can eat from this tree, but you can't this one, right? They can do anything they want, but don't eat that, just do this. And there's a lot more to that, but that's the basic idea. He gave boundaries on how to have rest and real relationship with him and with one another, Adam and Eve. Genesis 2.25 Look at what it says. In the beginning, we're starting, we, we talked about Genesis months ago through a series. Now, as a result of what God created and living that way, he says, now, here's the result. The man and his wife were both naked. I mean, don't dwell on that too long, but they felt nothing like we feel today when we say the word naked. They didn't walk around and even know that they were naked. They were free, they lived in a relationship with God, naked, and one another naked, and it wasn't something that it's turned into today in general. They've, they lived in rest and peace with God and one another, and the animals, and the creation, and it must have been beautiful. They had no clue what stress was. Anxiety did not exist. Fear, nothing. It's beautiful what is created. But then the enemy. The enemy comes and the, the devil comes and speaks lies. Listen to this. This is important for all of us because it is one of the roots. It's the lies that the enemy tells us about God and me. He has spoken lies to you, and you are not living in rest, and a lot of them create anxiety. So, for example, the three lies that we hear, I'm not going into a study on those. Did God really say you can't do that? And what is the enemy saying? You can't trust him. You won't die was the second lie, meaning he doesn't care. He, he doesn't care what you do. And the third one is, you know what? He knows that you will be like God. You don't need him. The enemy turns relationship and rest into the first experiences suddenly of shame, stress, fear, anxiety. And we will see it drove them to hide from God, cover up, believe a lie, but here is the beauty. In all of that, God is looking for them. Genesis 3, 7 through 13. In the beginning, after the enemy and after they fall and fail and they eat the fruit, they do what God said don't do. Stress, anxiety, all these things are created. At that moment, their eyes were opened. All this stuff flooded in for the first time. And they suddenly felt shame. Remember we just read. They didn't live in that. They didn't even know it existed. They felt shame at their nakedness. So what did they do? They covered up and hide what we still do thousands of years later. They sewed fig leaves. 
itchy leaves on their body to cover themselves up. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. Something that probably happened in the freedom of relationship and peace and rest. So what did they do? Instead of normally enjoying that, they hid from the Lord God among the trees. All the things that they felt, they did not feel them that they could go to him. The answer was, i got to take care of myself and hide. They're believing the lies of the enemy. The beauty of God's grace and love and relationship still today is this. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And that is the call for some of you today. This is not how you've... This is not how you're supposed to live. <clears throat> Where are you? What do you need from me? What do you want from me? He says this many times in the Bible. Where are you? And he replied, Adam did. I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. And here it is. Look at this. I was afraid. Because I was naked. Who told you that? Who told you you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, and this is how it gets worse. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. It's, not <laughs> it's what we do, dudes. It was the woman. You know what's the worst in this, though? It's the woman that, what? God, you gave me. You know what? That, isn't that interesting? It's not just her fault. Hey, God, it's your fault. So I ate it. Then the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? And she said, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. From then on, we have just experienced stress and fear and hiding and anxiety and the deep brokenness that we continue to try to cover up with fig leaves for thousands of years. It's not how we are intended to live. The enemy turned relationship and rest into the first experiences of shame, stress, anxiety, and fear. Drove them to hide from God, believe a lie, and cover up. When I believe those lies about God and me, I have fall into this place where I can't trust him, he doesn't care, and I feel that I don't need him. I got to do it. Some of the things I was working on were like, I begin to compare myself. We talked about this last week even. When I compare myself to others or to God or whatever, good or bad, comparisons, I compromise. I'm not like them, I'm better than them, whatever it is, and when I compromise, then I find I got to control it because I need to do something. I got to figure this out. And it costs relationships. It steals my rest, my peace, destroys my trust, and those, again, relationships that I have. Changes my whole perspective of life. It rewrites the past. It changes the narrative for the future. When I experience that anxiety and it drives me to the lies of the enemy, then that's what I experience. I was even just reading my Bible reading this week, going straight through, got to this place where the Israelites are freed after 400 years from the Egyptians. They go into the desert and just like days or weeks in, they're already complaining, comparing, then compromising and trying to control the situation by saying, you know what, when we were slaves in Egypt, we had great food to eat, it was awesome. For 400 years, they'd cried out for freedom. God gave them freedom, and suddenly, because of some anxiety that rose up, it drove them away from God. It does that to us today. We forget God and him being with us. So I operate in the fear and all that anxiety. I may feel a threat. It triggers fight or flight, which lead to that shame, fear, and lies. And here is even what's worse. It's what I prayed for the boys today. We lose our true identity in God. 
Some of you sit here right now and you're like, is this just me? This is not who I am. Why is this controlling me? But I would want to tell you, like God did thousands of years ago to Adam and Eve, he's doing it still today. He is looking for you. Where are you? Where are you? Don't hide from me. Yeah, but God, look at what I'm dealing with. Man, it's so, I'm so broken. Don't hide. Don't cover it up. I can heal that. I want to heal that. He is looking for you and calling you by name. You weren't created to exist in a constant state of anxiety and fear. Stress, burnt out, exhausted, feeling alone. We were, we are, and someday fully will be living in our true identity, freedom and rest. He's given us that. All right. So let me give you, over this last bit of time, how do I heal from this? This is just a practical thing. I'm going to say some stuff that's very practical, but it is a broad brush of the whole. Okay? Please, there's a lot more. You and I, um, and it's one of our missions here, we believe that we are helping people find Jesus and then be formed by him. I'll say it today like this. We are in a process of becoming someone. We'll never arrive until he comes back one day and perfects the whole thing. We are becoming. We are in a process of being formed by Jesus. Number one, here is this big idea that we need to do. You know the scripture, some of you. You try to practice it. It's from 1 Peter. But the first thing is to cast all your anxieties on God. This is from the NIV. I was reading in New Living, some of you might have, or other translations. I love the word cast. It has much more meaning to me. I think of being fishing with my dad and casting out the pole. And the idea was usually to get it out somewhere or in somewhere specific. I think of casting and just throwing it as far as I can. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7 Humble yourselves, that's key, we'll come back to it. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. There it is. Cast all, cast all, all. Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because what? Say it out loud. This is, this is against what the enemy is telling you. The enemy said thousands of years ago to Adam and Eve, he does not care about you. Today we are reminded he does. He's looking for you. He's calling you by name. Hey, Ron, you're hiding, buddy. I care about the dentist. I don't know what I'm going to do about it tomorrow, Ron. You're going to have to go through it. I'm not taking it away. But I care. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. What does it mean to cast all my anxieties on God? Well, means I, I read that the definition is to throw, throw forcefully in a specific direction, to throw upon, to put on. It, even one of the words was to hurl. Not hurl, but I mean you might need to do that too. I mean sometimes when you meet with me in a, in a prayer, it's not counseling, but I just say just throw up on the table, man. We'll start from there. And that's true. It's to place or put something on something or someone else with great energy, throwing forcefully. That means there is something about it that I love. That, hey, God, man, I want this as far, as far away from me as I can, and I just toss it, I, I just throw it to God. I like that. What does this scripture tell us concerning casting all anxieties to God? It tells me a couple things in this scripture alone. One is to be humble. Come humbly before the Lord, saying, I can't do it apart from him. And in humility, learning to be humble, it means I'm going to become self-aware and honest to God about my anxiety. Whatever that means for you. That could mean a lot of different things, I realize. Which leads to number two is to be honest. So this scripture tells us to be humble and to be honest. One is, 
to ask yourself, do I believe that God really cares for me? Because it says that in there. I'd stop right there for all of us at some point this week. Maybe you read that scripture and you ask yourself, do I really believe that God cares for me? Or does he just care about certain parts? I mean, let's start there. Because how can you cast anxiety upon someone that you don't even think cares about you? That's the deeper thing. That's the that's a root that it was a lie of the enemy. Do you believe God cares about you? If the answer is no, then you start there. That's honesty. That's humility. Hey, God, I don't think you care about me. Or there are certain things that you care about, but not this part of me. That's the deeper thing. Because what I believe about God matters. So being humble, being honest, is to be self-aware and honest what I'm anxious about. Worry becomes sinful when it dominates my life, leads to other sinful responses, or becomes detached from the truth and reality. In such cases, I need to investigate more earnestly what I believe, what I really want, and who or what I trust. And that matters. So then the writer writes in Philippians, let me read this to you and give you a couple thoughts out of it as well. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. This is that one, a lot of you know this phrase right here. Don't worry about anything. And we treat it so flippantly sometimes. Stop worrying. People have told me that before. Stop worrying about it. Man, if it was that easy, then okay. But I don't know about you. It's just not that easy for me sometimes. Don't worry about anything. Instead, what do you do? Pray about everything. Be humble. Be honest. That's prayer. Tell God what you what? Need. Tell him what you need. And thank him. There's gratitude for what he has done. Then, when you do that, you'll experience God's peace. It's obviously much greater than I can ever imagine, and we need that. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, because now he continues on. I think they go together. What do you do out of that? Okay, I'll do that. What do I do out of that? What facilitates? What keeps me going? What refocuses me? What reorients me? Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is, ah, this goes against the enemy. True, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent, worthy of praise. And then he says, this will be a principle in just a minute, keep putting into practice. Why? Because you're becoming someone formed into the likeness of Jesus by him. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, community, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God, then here it is again, the God of peace will be with you. It's important. What do we see out of that? Pray. What do you need from him today? Tell him. Tell him what you need. Experience that peace of God. It said guarding you. I need that. Use prayer as fixing your thoughts throughout the day and fighting the lies of the enemy. I'm sure in here right now there are lies of the enemy that are trying to poke through and tell you something different than what you're reading and hearing. God may care about everybody else, but he doesn't care about you. Pray. And prayer is sometimes just telling him what you need. Fixing thoughts. Thinking on these things. And then I said already, practice. Keep putting it into practice. It's what I told the parents today. Find regular rhythms in your day because it can seem so overwhelming and I'm putting so much upon you to now do all this stuff. And I'm just saying, in your day, work it in. Fix your thoughts. Oh, man, Lord, I just, out loud you could tell them, I just started believing a lie about me. You know what, that's not you, God. I just, out loud, tell you what it is, tell you what I need. God, reinforce that through others, your word, your spirit, and you got to keep putting it into practice. Why? 
Because you and I, we are conditioning ourselves to always go back to God. Like one of the things I'm doing, because I'm not good at it, even though I'm a pastor. I have to constantly reorient, I'll use that word a lot, condition myself to go back again, do it again, get up, you can make it, you can do it. It is not self-talk just about myself, it is going back to God who does that. Because I fail. We are conditioning ourselves to always go back to him. It is called practice. And then I told you last week, one of the things, it's, it's within all these stories and scriptures, is I believe that we need to create some margin in our lives to be able to rest, have real relationship, and help squelch the anxiety that wants to dictate my life. That we create space for that. David Kosand and I are going to teach the Sabbath group for five weeks on Tuesdays, 6.30 to 8. And it's going to help us in one way create margin that usually makes me think I won't have enough if I take this time. David was talking about him and Shannon experiencing that. Whether it's money or Sabbath, like giving time to God, I'm wondering in both, oh, if we do this, if I create this margin, this space, so that I can receive and bless and give and do all that he wants me to do, I'm not going to have enough. And I remember David just telling me the other day, you know what we discovered is, even though we gave up, God, we have enough. Because you think, I don't have enough time. And we're going to talk about that for five weeks and work through what it could look like in someone's life, whether it's 24 hours or a couple hours. Because what that will do when we create margin and space, financially, in various ways, this is for your kids as well. When you give space to God and say, God, I'm going to trust that you're enough. Now I can receive from you because otherwise I'm going to fill up because of my anxiety. It'll grow and I'll fill up my time so that I don't have to feel the anxiety that I'm experiencing. Now I have no time for God. Why wouldn't I believe the lies of the enemy? But when you create margin like that, you give yourself the opportunity, one, to be self-aware, to be humble. Oh man, God, I am, I am in the weeds right now. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I can see better. I can hear better. I can respond better when I've created some space. Otherwise, like a lot of us do, I'll overcommit. I'll say, man, I'm busy. I don't have time for that. And I will fill up to capacity, and I can't keep up with it. No wonder I'm going to make bad decisions or believe the lies of the enemy. So like Adam and Eve, they used to have space. <laughs> Walking with God, man. God, it's so relaxing. Look at that. Look at this. Look at them. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, man, they cram it. They hide. They fill up their time, and they don't have that walking with God heart. Creating margin, it gives me space to receive and to give, time to process, time to experience God's grace, time to discover the truth of who he is and who I am in him. In the margin, we establish some rhythms, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that help us. This verse is so profound and powerful. We have quoted it so many times, and we're probably going to do it many more, especially from the message, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burn out on religion? What does Jesus say? It's going to be the end principle. Come to me. What is it? Get away with me. Margin. Hey, Jesus, hey, this sounds good, man. I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. Anxiety is filling me, but I don't have time. I mean, you know my life. I'm just way too busy. And I would say, it's a lie of the enemy. He says, get away with me and you'll, re ooh, you'll recover your life. 
I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. This isn't guilt, shame, or forced things. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll live, you'll learn to live, you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen. Wow. So, unashamed pitch for the class. David and I want to encourage you. It's the next slide. Sign up for the Sabbath group. Okay. Saying. David's nailed it, I feel like. So this is my anxiety, buddy. Him and Shannon are nailing it. Been practicing Sabbath 24 hours for weeks. Expressing how great God is. I'm not doing that. <laughs> not that I'm not gonna. Heidi and I have talked about it. But I just, you know what, it creates that. And some of you feel that. And I would say, stop it. Sign up. App. Online. Fill out a card. Put it in the box, right? Five weeks, Tuesday nights, starting the 21st, okay? But hey, you can live in the the anxiety if you want. (laughs) All right. Next thing is that I see in all of this, and that kind of leads into commit to a community of care. This may be controversial for some. But you need to ask for help, which means you need to get help. I need to tell you this. Hear me clearly. I am a pastor. I am not a doctor. I am not a counselor. I am not a therapist. I am a pastor. If I tell you that I am one of those other things, it is a lie. I'm not trained in that. I'm trying to figure it out myself. I see a therapist. Use your, this is so beautiful to me, you take it for what you want, or you write me a letter if you disagree, I appreciate it. Use your God-given community of gifted and compassionate people to get help. Some of you, one of the greatest things you could do, I don't want to overstep my boundaries, is go see a doctor. Men, we're not as tough as we think we are. Sometimes there are things can be helped. See a counselor, a therapist, a mentor. I'm training to be a spiritual director, a workout partner, a small group leader, skilled individuals. When we need something done at the church or my home, I either go to YouTube <laughs> This sounds, YouTube's not enough either sometimes. I need a professional to help me. Why? Because I don't know how to do it or fix it. And that means commit to a community of care. That's why we push small groups. We We aren't counselors and therapists, but it's a community of people that are compassionate for you and love you in the name of God. Why do I say this? Physically, emotionally, spiritually, because you're a whole person. You are a whole person. You are a whole person that I believe, according to the scriptures, God cares about. He desires you to be whole, so I encourage each one of you, whatever that looks like for you, to care for your whole body. Psalm 37.5, commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, And he will help you. The last one is come to Jesus. The worship team, which is David Cosand, is coming up in just a moment. (laughs) Sounded so good, though. The worship team is coming. They're going to get up here way too quick. This seems to be some form of a principle. Every message that I share that is said the same 
It's the same. It's just said differently. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He is where I find, he is where I find real rest and true relationship, and I believe you can too. If you don't know Jesus today, come to Jesus as you are. He doesn't want you to stay there. He's going to help you become. He's going to form you. We're going to be part of community together. But he is where I find real rest, as he says in Matthew 11, and true relationship. Often, Often, often I forget that he is with me, that he is unanxious, unhurried. He knows who God is and who he is, and he is part of a bigger story. I want to leave you with this last story. I know some of you are going to go get ready for baptism. We're going to sing a last song as they're getting ready, and that's our wrap-up today, baptisms. I won't be back up, but... Come to Jesus, Mark chapter 4. Jesus is doing all sorts of ministry. He's traveling around. He knows his business. He knows his mission and vision. And evening comes. I've been on the Sea of Galilee more than once. And he says to his disciples, now listen to this. Jesus said do this, what they're about to do. Hey, let's cross to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee, about seven miles. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. That might be a thought for you too. Leave the crowds behind. Make your choices and decisions that are the most healthiest for your spiritual, physical, and emotional walk. But soon a fierce storm come up. They're going to happen, folks. Jesus, man, I just focused on that a couple days ago. Jesus said do this. Jesus said to do this. He knew this was coming. And a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Can you imagine the anxiety and stress going on right now? I've I've seen one of their boats. They're not that great. They're probably paddling hard, struggling like we do, and we're so anxious. If I could just row faster and row harder, I can fix this. I can get out of it. Jesus said, do this, and look at what it says. He was sleeping at the back of the boat. But I love even that little addition, with his head on a cushion. He's not just sleeping. His head is on a cushion. He said, do this. They're in a storm struggling. Waves are piling in, and he's back there snoring away with his head on a pillow. But what did we ask earlier? The disciples woke him up. They are stressed, full of anxiety. And look at what the lie is told to them. Teacher, what does it say? Don't you care that we're going to what? There's the story, the narrative. Hey, don't you care? You said do this. You're sleeping on a pillow. Don't you care that we're going to drown? We're going to die. When Jesus woke up, I don't know what that is, when he woke up? (laughs) Come on, man. He rebuked the wind, said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped. There was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? He is unanxious, unhurried in this whole situation. Stand with me, will you? As we just kind of wrap up with the song. What I kind of pictured was even in their anxiety, the encouragement was to wake him up, bother him, because he cares about you. Their lie was, you don't care. The answer was, don't you have enough faith? It's not my time to die, man. Why am I so relaxed, unanxious about this? Because I know the relationship that I have with the Father. I know the big story, so I can sleep like this because I know what's gonna happen, and now is not the time. But one of the things that they needed to do was wake him up. I know it's kind of a weird thing, but some of you feel like he's sleeping. And it felt like this, if I go back to the cast, that they just cast all this anxiety on him. And it felt like to me that he took it and he just cast it out in the ocean and it calmed down. I don't know how preachable that is, but that's what it came up for me. And, and in the end, you know, there's that last verse in there. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Why? Of him? No, but 
out of all this, they go, who is this man that even the wind and waves obey him? When we give our anxiety to him and we do it with the community of people, we get new revelations of who Jesus is. I see him. My perspective's different. And I'm reorienting and conditioning myself constantly to go back to him and suddenly I go, oh, who is this God? It's like I didn't know him. Today, Father, be with our anxieties, fears, worries. Turn them into new revelations of who you really are. And if someone here doesn't know Jesus, may they surrender their life to you today. And I pray this prayer written from Matthew 6, 31 through 33 for all of us. Before we sing, some may take communion to remember you, whatever it is, and baptize folks. Father, I admit to you, I often worry about my needs and wants. I've often believed, Father, a lie about who you are, who you say I am. Father, they often dominate my thoughts. They drive me to unhealthy decisions. Forgive me and fill me with your truth. And since you know me and care for me, Heavenly Father, help me to seek you, believe you, trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.